Amen. You may be seated for the reading of God's word. The reading is from Matthew, chapter 16, verses 13 through 20, and is on page 798 of your Pew Bible. Now when Jesus came into the district of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, Who do people say that the Son of Man is? And they said, Some say John the Baptist, but others Elijah, and still others Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. He said to them, but who do you say that I am? Simon Peter answered, You are the Messiah, the Son of the living God. And Jesus answered him, Blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father in heaven. And I tell you, you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church and the gates of Hades will not prevail against it. I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. Then he sternly ordered the disciples not to tell anyone that he was the Messiah. Word of God, word of life. Thanks be to God. Who do you say that I am? This is a question that will haunt Peter for the rest of his life. It's also a question that will shape who he will become and continue to become. He will be asked to answer this question over and over again as he builds a church as everything he thought he knew is challenged. And the same is true for every follower of Jesus. Who do you say that I am? I like you to think just a moment about the things that you say about Jesus, who you think Jesus is. I was challenged earlier this week in my reading for today to not answer this question right away, which I'd already answered for myself, to live in it for just a little while. Because it's so easy for us like Peter and the others to rush to the answer. Because the answers are obvious, right? Jesus is Savior, Lord, Redeemer, King, Son of God, Messiah, the way, the truth, the life, the good shepherd. I could go on and on and on. And all of these are true, and all of these are right. But in this day and age, what do they mean? What do they look like in our lives? How do these shape and reshape who we are as people of God? Who do you say that I am? So often we rely on these traditional descriptions of Jesus Or on the words of the creed that we say so often, I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, feel free to join me, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come to judge the living, and the dead. These familiar words. But what does it mean to a 21st century Christian? Every time I teach the Apostles' Creed, I ask people to write the creed in their own words. And it's hard, especially for our 6th and 7th graders, 
Because it's hard to break away from these beloved words that we know in our bones. None of you picked up your hymnal and quickly went to that page where the Apostles' Creed is at. But these words don't answer Jesus' question necessarily. They're about answering a larger argument that was happening between humans about who God was and answering it in a very theological way. The Apostles' Creed is good and true, but not always helpful to us to answer Jesus' question, which is why I think this invitation to live in the question of who Jesus is is key to our growth in faith as individuals and as a community. It keeps us from thinking more of ourselves than we ought, to borrow from Paul's writing in Romans 12, from thinking that we know everything we need to know and we can stop asking questions. Most of you know I'm a certified Myers-Briggs person. You want to know a little bit more about your personality? Come and see me. I'll help you out. So I know what I'm talking about when I say I always have an answer. And if you press me, I think it's always the best answer, but I try not to say that. As an ENTJ, making quick judgments and decisions is my jam. I see things people don't see. I know things people don't know. I am, as described to me early on, a field general. And I love swimming around in my field general persona. However... Not everything, in fact, most things, don't require my special skill set. So I, like many others, have had to learn to be more curious, to ask more questions, to assume that I don't know the answer, or at least try. Living in this question of Jesus invites us into a life that leads with curiosity, that is certain in its trust that Jesus is indeed our Messiah, but that he is also so much more than we can ever understand in one given moment. And to trust that Jesus, in Jesus, human beings are made more than we can ever imagine. In this question, Jesus invites us into a life of trust, not in the answers we so readily give, but in Jesus, the Christ, the one who died for us. Because let's be honest here, it isn't only the ENTJs of the world that like to have all the answers or to think they have the answers. This question of Jesus invites us to resist the urge to answer, to give advice, to offer solutions right away. Michael Bungay Stainer, who wrote The Coaching Habit and other great books, reminds us that to be a good leader, or I would say a good human, we need to stay curious a little longer. We need to rush to action and vice at giving a little bit more slowly. It's really hard. But this has changed my life. And Jesus models this for us, this way of life. He models this curiosity with his initial question. Who do people say that I am? He asks his disciples. Instead of assuming that he knows, Jesus asks and then listens to the answers. Because Jesus is building his community on this idea of being curious about one another on the regular practice of being open to something you haven't thought of or seen before. The early church continued to remain open to the Holy Spirit, asking questions of each other, having the courage to imagine new ways of being for the sake of the gospel. Even those in the Old Testament did better when they lived with curiosity and trust in God instead of assumptions that they knew best or had all the answers. Every time they thought they had the answers, things went badly. So when we open ourselves up, when we allow ourselves to be curious, to ask the questions, the Spirit has more freedom to move and live in new ways, helping us to see when the old ways, the old wineskins, need to burst. Who 
do you say that I am? Jesus asks you. But don't be so fast to answer. Live in this question. Because this question was just the beginning for Peter and is the beginning for us too. Because we are now the rocks that Jesus builds his church on here in the 21st century. So in what ways shall we build? We don't quite know. As we live in the question, discovering answers along the way, we tell the story of who Jesus is today in our time, not in ancient words of creeds written thousands and thousands of years ago, but in our own language. God becomes alive. We become more aware of not only what happens in us when we share that story, but how we are connected together, how we are members of each other, to borrow another phrase from Paul. Bound by this one who died and rose for us so that we can live a life of love focused on the other. This is how we build community. We tell the story of Jesus by telling the story of our life together. Have you noticed that the the house has been painted? that it's no longer that pinky, beigey, undescribable color? Anybody? That it's now a beautiful, yeah, staff has, beautiful blue color? If not, you should go by and see. That happened because of a grant from our foundation. Each year, our foundation, which you can give to any time if you would like, but we would love it if you would leave a legacy gift, gives away tens of thousands of dollars to high school seniors, to ELCA ministries, to community organizations, and toward capital improvements. We are proud that we have helped important ministries here at first, like the Teens Clothes Closet, get started. We love that we are able to support community organizations like St. Clair's Mission, help people in need that we otherwise wouldn't even know about. The First Lutheran Foundation can do that because of the generosity of Mabel Anderson and others who loved their church and wanted to leave a legacy of generosity. Did you know that each Monday our clothes closet helps teens find the clothes that they need? Sometimes overrun by the number of teens. But even more than that, that they have met the need of people by expanding what they give out to include toiletries, to include underwear and shoes. Thousands of pieces of clothing have been given to those in need, and their generosity is not slowing down. You can be a part of their story by volunteering on a Monday night, referring a teen in need, or donating cash or clothing. See Bridget right here in the front. Did you know we have a community garden at the house and have for more years than I can remember? Each summer, a small group of volunteers plants and harvests food for our local food bank. Tons of food is given so that those who are hungry are not only fed, but fed well. Did you know that we have three regular Bible studies and several small groups that meet together regularly, building community and understanding God a little more deeply? Praying together, wondering about what God is up to? The most amazing groups of people. Did you know that there are people still participating in worship online that have never been here to our church? Still? Not too long ago, I was at the Weber Center watching Rent with a few other people who happened to be members of this congregation, and someone, as I was leaving, stopped me and said, I know you, I see you on TV. Now, y'all, I don't have another gig. This is it. This is all I do. But she has been participating in our worship online for years now. And I'm sorry I was really awkward. I didn't know how to respond if you're watching today. Right? There are shut-ins that call me and tell me every time I visit them. We're so thankful for online worship. There are people with new babies who are like, we cannot get out of the house some mornings. I'm sure some of you know what that's like. We are so thankful for online worship. What you see here in this sanctuary is just a slice of who worships with us every week. Did you know that for over a year now, our youth programming has been led by our youth? 
that we have high school and junior high school students taking on the responsibility of putting together parents night out, MP3 nights and the like, with adult supervision, of course, but they do all the work. That's because we have given them the space to be who they want to be in this place, and they're doing amazing ministry. Did you know that for three years now, we've hosted the teachers and staff of our neighboring school during their prep week as a way to let them know that they're appreciated and supported? And that it's a highlight of their prep week to know that we see them and love them. These are just some of the stories that we don't necessarily know here at first because we're not here to participate in them. But they tell of the story of this community, of God's love pouring out of this place. They tell of who Jesus is or who we think that Jesus is. Who do you say that I am? I invite you to live in this question, to not rush to answer, but to open yourself up to the story the Spirit is weaving among us. I've decided that over the course of the next three months, as I'm away on sabbatical, I'm going to add this question to my nightly examine. And I'm excited to see what I will add to the story already that I tell that Jesus sustained me during the pandemic when nothing else did, that he burst open the Gospel of Luke for me last summer, deepening my understanding of discipleship and prayer and community, that he steadied me in the midst of chaos, filled my lungs with the breath of life when I thought I wouldn't be able to breathe, gave me courage to try new things like golf or swing dancing, And I am eager to see what else will be revealed. We build community as about leaning into this curiosity and love that Jesus models, about learning more about each other, about being slow to give advice or solutions, of telling stories of who we think Jesus is and what that looks like in our life together. It's about trusting one another as we trust our God when things look different or new. It's about love that is willing to sacrifice as Jesus does so that all will know love. We build community because it is what Jesus did. I wonder where he will lead us next. Amen. I invite you to stand as we sing.